All right, so we're doing a fireside chat now, and uh, and I'm pretty excited about this one. So Crystal will be joining in a little bit. Obviously, she is the uh, CEO of Sense Chat, and uh, and at the moment, so. Well, let's just start with you, Dave, and we'll just chat about your awesome product. So I have David Leibowitz here, and he's a business executive, writer, entrepreneur, blockchain enthusiast, founding team member, and director of partnerships and exchanges at Everypedia. And since first signing up for Everypedia in May 2016, he's been responsible for authoring thousands of pages that have received millions of views. Well done. And uh, you primarily work in business development at the moment. So welcome to the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, you're very far away there. It's like, uh, welcome to the chat. <laughs> Come a little, little bit. So let's talk about Everypedia. This is a really awesome project. And, uh, and I have a page on there which really excited me when I found yeah, that out I actually a while edited ago. it before I came here because I, I was like, I need to get to know the moderator. So <laughs> like, I edited, edited the page. it. She's yeah. awful. Um, no, so talk to us. What is You're Everypedia? wonderful. <laughs> You didn't add that to my Everypedia page. I, oh, I didn't add to this, don't I worry. Locked. Uh, so t <laughs> tell us, what is Everypedia? Um, why is it different to something like Wikipedia, for example? Well, Everypedia, I like to say, is a next generation, more inclusive, more modern encyclopedia. And I get asked all the time, like, hey, how's Everypedia different than Wikipedia? And I like to give context to that. So early on in Wikipedia's history, you had two camps of editors. You had inclusionists and deletionists. The inclusionists believe like, hey, everything should have a page. If there's a stub, it can be improved. The deletionists were more like, no, like we need to have strict standards. And around 2010, the deletionists won out. And what has, has happened since 2010 is you had this whole new world of influencers, YouTubers, of uh, people that are purely internet celebrities come online and become popular. And people are searching for them. And Wikipedia has ignored them time after time again. And so in 2015, where, when Everpedia was first started, that was the thought. We were in the inclusionist camp. We thought, hey, like, why can't these people have a page too? Why can't everything and everyone have a page as well? And so we were originally in that camp. And ever since 2015, uh, we've been building since then. Uh, 2017, we started exploring blockchain. In 2018, as you all know, we went on to build on EOS. And we are now the blockchain encyclopedia. And really excited to share what we're building. And, um, what announcements I have in store. For sure. So why did you guys choose to go with EOS? Um, we saw EOS as the blockchain that could actually handle Everpedia. As you know, Ethereum, uh, they can only handle so many transactions per second. But EOS, they can handle hundreds th or thousands of transactions per second. And also, we had a lot of support within the EOS community. We developed a lot of relationships. We saw a lot of enthusiasm. And so we just saw Everpedia as a natural fit in EOS. That's awesome. And explain like how it actually works. How does this actually interface with the blockchain? Is there all the data on there? Is it like, like explain a little more yes, about that? Yes, yes. Uh, so I'll explain how the token works. So Everypedia, it runs on the IQ token. And how it works is editors put up IQ in order to make edits. So it's literally editors, that's their stake in the article. So let's say I was editing your article. I put up 50 IQ. I submit it, and then our community of editors, they vote on the edit with their IQ tokens. So if they see if it's a good contribution, they'll vote to approve it. If they see, like, oh, like, this could be better, or this is spam, like, they'll vote to reject it. And so there's a 12-hour voting period, and after 12 hours, if it's approved, then the editor and the voters that voted for it, they get rewarded with newly minted IQ tokens. And if it's rejected, then those tokens are staked for a longer period of time. So that's how it works from a token perspective. And actually, all our data is decentralized, and it's stored on IPFS. And so we're really proud of our developers are really proud of how uh, decentralized our platform is at the moment. It's really awesome. And I think that we've also seen this shift that's happened in society where um, there used to be gatekeepers for knowledge and we used to have just a few a handful of cable companies oh, yeah. you know, distributing this knowledge, a handful of radio stations, etc. I mean, and you can argue that Wikipedia has gatekeepers as well. For like, sure. There's only 5,000 editors to Wikipedia and there, that's like it's, I don't know, millions, billions of views. And you only have 5,000 editors of controlling it, and they have very arbitrary control over those pages. We're actually more democratizing the judging and the voting process rather than just having these, these 
dictatorial control that happens on Wikipedia, uh, we're much more open to new contributions. For sure, and I think with that shift, we've seen a couple of things happen. Right? We've definitely seen the democratization of knowledge, as you mentioned. This is more accessible than ever before. Anyone can contribute to these things. Um, that it also means that there's a lot more noise out there. You know, when you see all these content creators is saying like, this oh, is yeah. the truth, and uh, all this conflicting information. Um, so it's do you hard think out that, there. <laughs> yeah, what do you think about that? Like, do you think that it's a net benefit Benefit just because inclusion in terms of a principle is something that we should in adhere to anyway. Um, do you, I mean, how hard is it to sift through the noise these days? Um, I think it's definitely a benefit. I think when it comes to these encyclopedia platforms, whether it's Everpedia or Wikipedia, these, uh, the pages that are on there are living documents. So they're always going to be updated. They're always going to be improved. And some people don't realize that people kind of view uh, these wiki sites as like the final bearer of truth, but in reality, they're just meant to give context on people and situations and events. And so I think in terms of sifting through the no noise, we're always gonna be sifting through the noise. It's just a matter of like, how close can we get to like the right general picture. Right, and I think we always had this idea when you're talking about these living documents. I remember when I used to have a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> that was the knowledge. And it really is a mental shift that occurs when you start to realize that history is not necessarily just something that's Yeah, it's static not thing. stagnant, not at all. It's always changing. There's always something new that's coming out about an event. Yeah, new, new facts are being discovered all the time. Different things are being interpreted different ways. And let's be honest, I mean, history is written by the victors in society. So um, you tend to have of this like this idea of truth as this fixed thing, um, whereas there can be lots of different interpretations of events and things. So I think it's really cool what you guys are doing and allowing people to contribute. Can you talk about the incentivization process on the platform? You said that people have to stake money, the IQ token, yeah. in order to contribute. Do you think that that helps with people providing um, truthful information or when people have to vote on oh, these absolutely. things? How does all that work? Absolutely. Well, back in um, July of 2018, that's when we did our airdrop. So we airdropped to 51% 50, uh, of our tokens, the EOS token holders. And um, so right there, we had 160,000 people that could participate in Everpedia off the bat. And so in terms of, can you repeat the question again? Oh, I just so, want to know about the incentivization process. So, I mean, with Wikipedia, people don't get paid for editing. Yeah. And, um, and so there's like a strange incentive process that happens there and you have these gatekeepers of knowledge. And then with, uh, with Everpedia, people have to pay, but then you also have this voting oh, system yeah. that also is an incentivization process. Are there any, um, like, uh, do people get red, black yeah, dots so next to their name oh, if so they put a change forward and, and people don't vote for it and say No, 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 actually, so like I said earlier, like people get rewarded for their positive contributions to the network and actually a new feature we just implemented are editor streaks so let's say you edit uh, every day you actually get like a star like similar to snapchat how snapchat has their snapchat streaks so actually you get rewarded um, socially for your contributions not only uh, incentivized through the token but like i said socially and how much engagement are you seeing on the platform? Because you said that this is something that is unique in that um, it offers information about a wider variety of topics. So Wikipedia is very closed. You, I, I generally wiki things when I want to learn yeah. about them because I like it. I really like Wikipedia. I think that um, it, it allows you to learn things about uh, different topics. But as you said, they don't cover everything. Yeah. And there's a lot they don't cover. So what kind of engagement do you see and what are the most um, popular topics that you've seen? Yeah, I like to call call Everpedia the up-and-coming wiki and culture, which are the wiki and up-and-coming topics and culture. So like I said earlier, like anything internet-related, current events, uh, e-celebs, influencers, um, anybody in that respect. Uh, they're super pop popular among our readership, among our editors. We have editors uh, creating pages about all sorts of things. I know we have one editor that loves boxing and is always making pages for boxers and boxing matches that has happened. We ha have another editor that's super interested in science and she's already always editing science Wikipedia imports. So we have like a lot of different ways how people are engaged, whether they're readers or editors. I think that's awesome. And I've also loved to see this evolution of this tokenomics in, in terms of uh, information. Yeah. You know, there are lots of people who are saying, like, how do we solve fake news? How do we, you know, and I'm not sure this is something we can solve. But yeah. it is interesting to see these different models pop up where you're all trying different things. Yeah, I think with everything that what we're doing, what other projects are trying to doing, we're all, it's just all one giant experiment of how we can get closer to, quote unquote, the truth and how we can get closer to factual information. 
and we all want that. That's the ultimate goal. It's just a matter of how we're getting there. And I think Everpedia is one of the most, if not the most promising way to get there. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about decentralization of knowledge as well, because I think that when you're talking about gatekeepers, it's not just the companies that are trying to safeguard their industry and their position in that industry. It's often used for nefarious purposes. It's often leveraged by uh, government, governments. Uh, it's often, uh, you know, there's a tremendous propaganda machine out there where the government is trying to leverage and, and the media becomes these mouthpieces of the state. So how important do you think this new evolution of decentralized knowledge platforms are, uh, given the current climate of censorship around the world? I think they're absolutely vital to keep people informed, um, whether they're in the United States or abroad. Um, when you were saying about this, uh, about governments trying to like influence organizations, that's why I think independent news organizations are really vital to the whole news ecosystem and really vital to Everpedia. Like one of the problems is with Wikipedia is sometimes your sources aren't notable enough. So a lot of times those independent sources aren't notable and they might be like, oh, this this, we have to get rid of this edit because this independent source isn't notable enough. Like that, We wouldn't have that problem on our platform. Right, there's this sort of elitism that happens, especially with the wards and, and things like that, where yeah. it's, it's very much a, um, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. And I, I mean, I, I tend to disregard awards a lot. Yeah. I, Nobel <laughs> Prizes, all of that. I've just seen too much corruption in that. Uh, but it's sad to see platforms where yeah. those things carry a lot of weight and you have this chosen few who get to decide who the oracles are, who the people who have reliable information are. I just think that there's, um, it, it's too corrupt a system. Yeah, that's why I see so much hope and promise in the Everpedia community. I just see all our, our editors just growing, all talking to each other. Um, I know we're going to get into the new features later, but one of the things we've implemented is chat on pages. And in effect, every Everpedia page is a chat room for editors and people that are curious to discuss the page and discuss the topic. That's, that's actually really cool because sometimes you read um, Wikipedia and, and the way that it's phrased is like, this is this thing. Some people yeah. think this, though. I, w I would love to have knowledgeable people discuss that and, and understand yeah. like, well, why do they think those different things. Yeah, and on Wikipedia, the problem with their talk page is it's, Crystal, all, in, come on up, it's yeah. all in markup language. Yeah. So it's really difficult for like even normal people to understand and read it. But with Everpedia, it's just it's just like a chat room. Super simple. I think that that's a really cool development. Hello. I, um, I'm going to welcome <laughs> these two uh, gorgeous ladies up to the stage. Uh, so, uh, Crystal. We have Crystal Rose Pierce. Uh, you guys don't need me to introduce her, but I will anyway. Uh, so she is in the Forbes Top 10 Women in Blockchain. She's the CEO and founder of SenseChat Labs, a communications company building SenseChat, private messaging and decentralized applications on the blockchain, co-founder of Shios, female-run block producer on the ES Network, and the Shios Foundation, providing computer science scholarships to young women. And uh, what's your name, lovely? Aurora, the first, the youngest ever lady on uh, to have a, an EOS account and probably a crypto account, correct? <laughs> yeah, she's on the blockchain, Aurora Rose Pierce. <laughs> Aurora Rose Pierce, you're gorgeous. And is that, I mean, that's not her Halloween costume, that's like her everyday wear, right? Exactly, this is her preview. <laughs> she's gorgeous. So Crystal, tell me about Sense Chat. Talk to me about that journey and why you decided, because you, you were speaking earlier. Um, well, no, you weren't speaking earlier. Um, but someone was mentioning earlier the transition from Ethereum to EOS. And uh, just talk to me about why that was, why you decided to go with EOS. Yeah, Autumn was mentioning earlier, Shios uh, had built the EOS 21 protocol, which is the teleportation from the Ethereum network over to EOS. And, and that was really... Um, a, a combination of, of circumstances, the first being that anyone who had originally built uh, on Ethereum or had intended to, if you wrote a business plan, started a token sale, thought that you would build application software on Ethereum, you quickly found out that the network is not extremely scalable for building apps. Uh, it's just not cost effective, gas is expensive, um, and you know users just are not able to do basic everyday microtransactions. I think if Everpedia were built on Ethereum, it, it just would work. it wouldn't work. It, it wouldn't, wouldn't be work. the same thing. So we learned that very quickly. Building a messenger on top of Ethereum uh, would not, just would not scale. And I think a lot of others have come into that as well. So we moved our entire software very quickly uh, in June when last year in 2018 when EOS launched and, uh, and quickly saw that it would be a much better solution. 
beyond that, the accounts having real readable names were a huge benefit for us. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk uh, in depth. So we've been talking a lot about Everypedia at the moment and about their journey. I want to talk about SenseChat because I think there are some similar themes there. We're talking about sort of the democratization of knowledge, breaking down those barriers. You see in terms of you know, social media and messaging, there are a lot of gatekeepers in that industry as well. And it gets a little bit scary because um, we just had a few presentations. People talk about getting kicked off a lot of these platforms. So talk to me about how valuable it is to have a decentralized, you know, messaging app and one that's safe and secure as well. DApps are an interesting thing. I think decentralized application is a, a beautiful goal yet not fully achieved. We're more distributed, if anything. Uh, what I really love about uh, Everpedia is that it, it's, a, it's a human knowledge information sharing platform that gives you real rewards. You're, you, if you ever contributed to Wikipedia, the most they've ever done for you is ask you for a donation. Thank you for contributing. She does not like also that. give us money. Um, exactly, and and it's it's just not a good it's just not a good experience because you've given all of your time, you've given all of your data, you've given all of your knowledge, and yet you're still finding that the 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 economy of the platform is not structured correctly. And and we find that with mes messaging as well as social media, you're giving time, data, contribution. Facebook is the number one media platform in the world today. If you look by volume and size, they're worth more than ABC, Fox, and many other networks combined, yet they, do, they don't own any content. The content's actually owned by the creators. The content's owned by the, the members of the network. So we, we have a philosophy that, um, you know, it's, it's a great thing to have data everywhere if you are a contributor of networks, but you should own it and you should get a cut of the revenue that's coming in. And for SenseChat, uh, we'd rather just not scan and store your data at all. Uh, the, the bigger idea here is peer-to-peer -peer messaging. The, what Bitcoin did for digital currency, SenseChat is striving to do for digital conversation. Uh, basically, you should be able to have a conversation like in person, ephemeral, not tracked, not scanned, not spied on. We don't need a lot of other people understanding and listening to our conversations. And, and Facebook does it for the purposes of protecting you. Um, but actually retargeting you for ads is more, more likely. So yeah, and I also maybe being a, a leverage tool for governments as well there. Um, you mentioned the incentivization process that, um, that happens there with the you know, data collection and the reward system of contributing and, and all of these things. And it's right. I think we're really, there's a paradigm shift that's happening now where we're starting to realize or the individuals are starting to realize their value and what places like Google have been capitalizing on for so long. And, uh, and we're just starting to see that uh, decentralization and democratization and that's a really exciting shift and um, and another exciting shift is the focus on privacy we're starting to see so you mentioned that this is you guys just don't like holding that information because you know you don't want that liability you don't want to actually have to store that stuff and then be have a t giant target sign for hackers who might steal it um, so just don't collect it so like talk about the evolution and this trajectory towards privacy do you think that offering more services like SenseChat where it is a private you know, chat messaging platform. Do you think that this is going to start to encourage consumers to want to demand things like this more? Absolutely. It's, it's inherent that our devices are private to us. I think people don't know the terms that they're agreeing to when they agree. Mm -hmm. they, I want to use the network, I'm going to agree to the terms. And eventually you slowly have private conversations. Um, you know, the internet didn't know I was pregnant, actually. I had one WhatsApp group and I was targeted for ads on Instagram and it didn't make any sense to me other than the terms of service that I finally read from Facebook that says we do scan all of your messages through AI before storing them. And yes, they're stored even though they're encrypted, but we have the keys and you don't. But what's great about blockchain and especially the EOS network, you have your own keys. So if we're going to encrypt something, why not give the keys to the individual and let them unlock it, not the platform? So if the government or others come to subpoena and take the information, we don't have that information. Unlike, so something like Everpedia, if it's public on purpose, that's different. And now I've not only made it public, I want to keep it immutable so I can have a value. So I think that the, you know, the two platforms are really complementary in the way of we're addressing both sides of the problem. You know, one is content co contribution where it's a public format that you're not getting the value for on most networks. And the other is the right to be private or the right to be forgotten if you want to have your data completely be obscured. And even Snapchat who said, 
ephemeral was not deleting your photos off of the network when they had the hacks and hundreds of millions of photos were exposed. It's just, we can't trust these platforms that are centralized. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I love seeing new decentralized privacy conscious platforms uh, out there because I just think that we need to get more people onto those. I see too many people you know, talking with each other on Facebook when they don't need to. There are much better products out there and we should be encouraging others. Like the people in this room, we're the ones who know about the alternatives. You know, if you're not personally bringing individuals onto these platforms and saying like, these are better options, try them out, no one's going to be doing that. You know, it's, it's up to us to be building that movement and continuing it and supporting the awesome work that these people are doing. Um, so you talked about you know, just trying to get people to be privacy conscious and, and all of that. And I think that that is, um, is a struggle that people come across and uh, trying to show people, you know, why decentralization is important. It's a struggle. What are some other challenges you guys have faced in building your platforms? Yeah, one of the problems when we first launched Everpedia on the blockchain was getting people to sign up as editors. First, you needed to have an EOS account, and in the beginning, it was a whole process. So one of the things we actually implemented was we are working with ORID to have social accounts allow people to log in so people can log in with their email, with their Facebook, with their Twitter, and they can start editing. So that's one way we got over that problem. It's inherent that a user can use their email address or phone number or other private data to sign into something. We, that's natural. Uh, then we forget that we've just given them the most private thing that we have. Our, our phone numbers are like our social security numbers. We know that because with two-factor authentication, terribly, most of the crypto community who has substantial holdings have gotten attacked in some capacity who are, who are public. And we've seen many, many tens, of not, if not hundreds of millions of dollars being ex exploited and taken from these accounts uh, because of simply their phone number. I, I had a business card actually at a conference a couple years ago that was posted on a board that was taking a photo and posted on Steemit. And Steemit is immutable on the blockchain, can't be deleted after a week. My phone number is permanently on this board because I gave this person my card. So I, I messaged him and I said, what are you doing? You've just exposed all of the people in blockchain, all of the major players in crypto. You're so proud to get their card that you exposed their phone number. He's like, well, why did you put your real phone number on the, on the card? <laughs> good, good point. Okay. A valid, valid. So now today my card has a QR code to message me on SenseChat and that's it. I'm, I'm not actually going to give away my phone number anymore. And if we do implement phone numbers in the future, which we may on our, on our app, we want everyone to know that they're hashed. They're on your local device. We don't take them. We don't associate them with your EOS account. We don't associate them with your data. The worst thing that we do is associate identity with data without the user's express permission. And encryption... Encryption is great, but talk to someone like David Chom, who is building Elixir or the Praxis protocol. Um, quantum computing can break any encryption. So let's just give it 10 years, 20 years. All of our encryption is going to be moot anyway. So you know, really, it's a matter of, do I want my data stored at all? And that's why we decided peer-to-peer -peer is a better format. It's a throwback to the old internet. 20 years ago, it was all peer-to-peer. -peer. If you were on AOL or ICQ, the other person had to be online. There was a reason. They just didn't have the infrastructure to store the data, actually. And they were like, if you want to message each other, it's ephemeral. It's, it's like having a real conversation. This isn't stored. Well, I suppose we have cameras. But you know, it's, it, it, these cameras represent what's happening to the messaging space, as well as every other place that we put our data today. And it's without express permission. I don't think it's OK. We need alternatives. We can keep using the other incumbent platforms, but let's have alternatives. Yeah, and I love this journey that we're going down uh, towards more peer-to-peer -to -peer tech. I think that, like, I don't know if anyone's read Snowden's book. I know that he was mentioned in one of the talks earlier today. It's fantastic, and I highly encourage everyone to read it. He gives a really great account of, like, the history of the internet, why he loved it when it first started. It was peer-to-peer. -peer. It was this very um, you know, anonymous place or pseudonymous place where he could just be himself and, and throw ideas out there and play around. And now, you know, our identities are so tied uh, to our online, Person, personalities and that's there forever you know there's a permanent record of, of all of us and everything we've ever said and that gets really scary and, and so I love what you guys are doing to try to decentralize that to take back control of that data and I think that we're all going to benefit tremendously from it so thank you guys so much for the work you're doing if you haven't checked out both of their platforms you need to immediately but thank you very much thank you